The scripture reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark. It's verse, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And I should probably say before I start reading, this is what scholars think is the shortest and most, well, it is the shortest ending of Mark, but they think it's the most original. And the, you know, it goes on to a couple other verses, 9 through, I think, 13 or 14. But those were added on lately, so uh, later. So we're going to just stick with this original 1 to 8 for now, okay? When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But the young man said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May God bless and challenge us in the reading of this word. Oof. He is alive. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, music ministry. He is alive. He is risen. That's the news that transforms, the news that will change the world. Or in the words of the young man sitting there in Jesus' empty tomb, he has been raised. How long do you think it took for those words to sink in to the women going to the tomb that morning? A minute? Five minutes? I mean, those women, they had watched Jesus be crucified. They watched him suffer. They heard his last cry, felt his last breath. They watched his lifeless body taken down from the cross, carried to the tomb, and then watched that stone rolled in front of the tomb with their own eyes, with their own eyes. So when they go in and they find this young man sitting there, telling them not just who they were looking for, oh, you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. But where Jesus was, how long do you think it would have taken them to move from shock, past fear, to actually telling someone? In this ending of Mark, we don't know. We don't get the answer. The women don't go and tell anyone. For amazement and terror had seized them, so they just stayed there. But then you can't really blame them, can you? I mean, we don't like it when Jesus isn't where Jesus is supposed to be. Most of us, if we're honest, we like it when we can go and find Jesus and Jesus is right there, exactly where we left him, exactly as we left him. 
trusty old friend Jesus, who we know and love, and most of all, the Jesus we understand. We like it when Jesus is predictable. We like it when Jesus is personable. And most of all, we like it when Jesus, Jesus is portable. So whenever and wherever we need him, we can take him out of our back pocket or clutch him on a chain hanging around our neck. And he's right there. Like so many times before, thank you, Jesus. And he'll do just what he's done before. Thank you, Jesus. Because he is our Jesus, my Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. <laughs> no judgment. We all do it. We all like to cling to what we can count on. So when Jesus is not where and how we expect, yeah. We're frazzled and shocked and terrified and amazed, and so were the women. But I sense that Mark, leaving us simply with they were afraid, is actually somewhat of a gift. Yes, we may be denied that picture of resurrected Jesus, but for Mark, Jesus cannot be a possession. Jesus can't be grasped or held or pinned on our lapel. Mark knew that when we are given a Jesus that we can hold on to in our two little dust hands like an action figure and claim as our own that, well, we have a tendency to hang on so tightly and to squeeze the life out of it and to misshape it and eventually remold it until our little Jesus meets our little needs and Jesus turns out to look a lot like us. And sadly, that means our Jesus is very small. Instead, Mark gives us a Jesus who can't be grasped, a Jesus who is already out in the world. When the young man in the tomb relays Jesus' words of promise, they come with directions. Jesus told you when all this is over, he'd meet you in Galilee, and he's already there. Why? What's in Galilee? I'll tell you what's in Galilee, the poor, the marginalized, the sick, the outcast. It's where Jesus' ministry began, Galilee. In Galilee, yeah, we'll see Jesus again, still feeding the hungry, still driving out demons, still preaching hope to the brokenhearted, healing those in distress, still breaking down walls that separate people, still out there protesting justice, agitating, activating, because that's what Jesus does, so that's where Jesus is. And there's something else in that message. He has been raised that maybe we as moderns miss, but Mark's audience wouldn't. That Greek verb raised that we translate rise or awaken, in Greek thought, it emphasizes the gathering up of one's scattered thoughts or unconscious attentions and bundling those to a unified purpose. Let me say that again. It's a mouthful. It means a gathering up of one's scattered thoughts or unconscious attentions and bundling these into a unified purpose. So for the first followers of Christ, those words, he has been raised, would have been very clear. They may not have been able to see and touch and hold the resurrected Jesus, but he has been raised to them, served as a recall it would call them back from their scattered, scared, scarred selves to a unified purpose. 
Remember who Mark was writing to. He was writing to a people who were actively being persecuted. They, they have seen their temple destroyed. Their city was destroyed. A million Jews killed. And now they were facing persecution for their faith. They were actually and actively suffering. He has been raised, says to them, yes, you're afraid. I know you're afraid. Yes, you're in pain. I know you're in pain. And you probably can't think straight right now, but he is raised. We are one body. Unify, focus, move, heal, advocate, include, love. Go to Galilee. Because it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Amen. Let's go down one layer deeper. Because there's one thing we haven't talked about, this messenger, this young man who's seated in the empty tomb in the long white robe. It's weird, right? It's weird. The word translated young man appears only one other time in the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus is arrested, there's a young man, a Neanus ghost, it's called. And he's present at the arrest in the garden. And he's wearing, strangely, only a linen cloth, the same linen cloth that you would use to bury someone. A death shroud. And after they bind Jesus' hands, the guards try to grab this young man, too. But they only get hold of the linen burial robe. The, the, the Neoniscos runs away, naked. We never talk about this little detail, but it was important enough for Mark to include intentionally in the middle of one of the tensest moments in Scripture when Jesus is betrayed and arrested. Who was the naked young man? Some scholars think it was the gospel writer himself. They think it was Mark. And this serves as his confession, but I'm not sold on that. I sense it sta that he stands for humankind, for us. Surely he represents our inability to stay and watch and wait. Surely, in him we see our propensity to clothe ourselves in shrouds of death whenever we're afraid and run whenever we feel trapped to free ourselves from any kind of suffering which, yes, leaves us naked. You know, when we're naked and we're vulnerable and cold and exposed and there's a lot of shame there. Running naked? Gosh, we're all over the place. Our minds are scattered. In fact, we're out of our minds. We're not knowing which way to turn. He certainly embodies our fragility, our weakness. Yes? But Mark gives us no clue to his identity. Only one, actually. The word neoniscos, young man, only shows up twice, I said. It's Neoniscos, who is in the empty tomb, sitting on the right. He's dressed not in a linen death shroud that he wore in the garden, but he's in a fresh, white robe of life. He's no longer afraid. He's no longer scattered and running. They found him seated, clothed, and in his right mind. Where have I heard that phrase before? Right, right, in the story of the Gerasene demoniac. Remember the young man who was tortured by a legion of demons and he was so out of his mind that the, the townspeople kept trying to chain him up outside in the tombs and he kept on breaking the chains and he kept running away naked and afraid. And Jesus met him there 
And Jesus healed him. And afterward, they found him seated, clothed, and in his right mind. Isn't that what resurrection looks like? Isn't that what wholeness looks like? Isn't that why Jesus went through death and resurrection so that we too can be restored? That like Neoniscos, we can rise with Jesus free of death, free of fear and shame, no more running. We rise and afterward we find ourselves seated clothed and in our right mind. My friends, you see, resurrection does not come at the end of the gospel. Resurrection comes at the beginning. Resurrection comes the moment the kingdom of God is announced, heralded by Christ. Resurrection appears over and over again with a power that transforms through every moment. It's present in every healing, every act of forgiveness, every miracle, every word that comes forth from the mouth of Christ and is received and embraced and lived out. That's resurrection. Resurrection was present the moment that God told God's people, I love you with an everlasting love. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And the people of God said, yes, yes. And my friends, make no mistake, resurrection is happening right now. It happened today. It happened every day that we say it's another glorious day to worship God. It happens every time we claim God loves us just the way we are no matter what. It happens every time we gather to serve and work and grow as a people. It happens every time we speak a word of forgiveness. Every time we work to, bro to reconcile a broken relationship, every act of healing. Resurrection happens every time we embrace the truth that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Every time we claim that we are children of light despite how we think or feel or act. Resurrection happens in every touch of grace, every tear of compassion, and every breath of hope. Just look at all of you. Go ahead. Look at all of you. All witnesses to the resurrection that has happened here among us, yes? Through Christ, love is reborn. We are reborn every time we meet in this place where hope leads and love wins. Happy Easter, my friends. Now go meet him in Galilee. Amen. If you are able, please rise and join us in singing Alleluia. Sing to Jesus. Alleluia. Amen.
say.